Edward Said Memorial Lecture of this year. May his memory and lessons remain flourishing in our minds and lives. I am Feriel Ghazoul, Professor of English and Comparative Literature at AUC. Edward Said was my professor and mentor at Columbia University. And, uh, he supervised my PhD dissertation. Edward Said, who was born in Palestine and spent his childhood and adolescence in Egypt, settled as a university professor at Columbia University in New York. He continued to visit Cairo regularly where he felt at home. Our English and Comparative Literature Department and the School of Humanities and Social Sciences invited Edward Said as a distinguished visiting professor several times. And whenever he visited Cairo, he was most willing to visit AUC and share his knowledge with students. Uh, he received an honorary doctorate from AUC in 1999. His last lecture at AUC was in 2003, a few months before he passed away. To perpetuate his legacy, the Department of English and Comparative Literature initiated an annual memorial lecture in his name with the support of the AUC administration. We have invited distinguished speakers in the varied fields to which Said contributed, literature, music, criticism, philosophy, politics, human rights, cultural studies, and Palestine. Here is a list of distinguished speakers who have graced the series with their addresses. David Damrosch, Barbara Harlow, Cornel West, Terry Eagleton, Rokis Lohrut, Judith Butler, John Carlos Williams, Michael Wood, Sari Magdesi, Marina Warner, Bashir Suleiman Dien, Usama Magdesi, Robert Young, and Wadia Edward Said. That was, that was in uh, uh, 2019. It was always our intention to schedule the memorial lecture on Said's birthday, November 1. As the occasion is meant to celebrate his life and his accomplishments rather than mourn his physical absence. The invited speaker after delivering the memorial lecture would visit the family residence of Said in Zamalek where he lived in the late 1940s and 1950s, now commemorated with a plaque indicating Edward Said lived here. Usually, our distinguished speaker would pay a visit to the very location and place recalled in Said's memoir, Out of Place. The speaker would be welcomed by a reception gracefully hosted by former neighbors and childhood friends of Edward Said, the Gindi family, Hoda, Nadia, and Shadia, who continue to reside in the same building, one Aziz Osman Street. However, given the pandemic, we are having the Edward Said Memorial Lecture this year 
as a webinar and not in person. Furthermore, we had to schedule the event in the spring rather than on Edward's birthday on the 1st of November. Our 2022 distinguished speaker is an eminent human rights lawyer and an eminent creative writer who received the prestigious Orwell Prize in 2008 for his book, Palestinian Walks, Notes on a Vanishing Landscape. Raja Shahadi's address today is entitled The Peregrination of Memory, The Case of Palestine. My colleague and friend, Hani Sayed, Professor of Law and Director of the Program of International Human Rights and Justice at AUC, who is a vocal admirer of Raja Shahadi's contributions to law and human emancipation, will introduce our distinguished speaker. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you, Faryal, for giving me the honor of introducing this year's speakers for the Edward Said Lecture. And I would like to use the short minutes allocated to me to introduce our speaker, to also explain why, from my position as a legal academic, this task is indeed an honor. For more than 70 years now, to be Palestinian wherever you are is to inhabit on this earth a liminal space that can be best described as limbo. In this limbo, Palestinians dispossessed, displaced, encircled, or dispersed do not have, to use Hannah Arendt's expression, the right to have rights. I use the word limbo to describe the legal and political position of Palestinian not as a vague rhetorical hyperbole. In Dante's Inferno, limbo is the first circle of hell reserved for those who did not sin and yet cannot be saved, like unbaptized children or virtuous pagans. Virgil, Dante's companion in limbo and one of those virtuous pagans, described the inhabitants of limbo as those who are afflicted only in that they live for eternity in longing without hope. Dante's limbo is unique in that it raises an important theological question about the divine justice of this inferno. The dilemma is this, a sinner earns his place in hell because they were endowed with free will and they chose sin. But why should divine justice dictate that those who did not choose to sin deserve a place in hell? In, Palestinian, in this Palestinian limbo, our speaker today, Rajash Hadi from Yafa and Ramallah made the impossible choice to become a lawyer. The choice is impossible because when you do not have the right to have rights, the labor of law becomes riddled with paradoxes. The pragmatic and utilitarian calculus of winning and losses can hardly apply when your occupier has the physical power and institutional ability to use the legal system to redefine the very fabric of the space you inhabit and to change the direction of the arrows of time and causality. Under these conditions, Raza's choice, Raza choice to, be, to be a lawyer is difficult to characterize. It cannot be rational, and yet it is not madness. Becoming a lawyer under these conditions is more than a professional choice. It is more than a political choice. It is a leap of faith in a radical existentialist sense. Faith, Kierkegaard tells us, is no aesthetic emotion, but something far higher. It is not the spontaneous inclination of the heart, but the paradox of existence. In 1979, when Rajash Hadi founded Al Haq, a pioneering Palestinian human rights organization and affiliate of the International Commission of Jurists, international lawyers hardly knew anything about the situation in occupied Palestine. 
And what they knew was too short-sighted to understand the irreducibly colonial nature of the occupation, its nefarious objective of controlling the land and expelling its people, and the systemic connections between the policies that were being applied in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and also their systemic connections with the policies inside the Green Line. Ever since, as a lawyer, a legal academic, and even at some point as an advisor to the Palestinian delegation in DC during the peace negotiations that followed the Madrid Peace Conference, and as a writer, Raja was able, with nothing but the force of his intellect, stubborn perseverance, and the aura of his grace to make the world recognize that this Palestinian limbo is human, all too human, and it is not a theological conundrum. Through the power and rigor of his legal analysis, uh, his two books in particular, Occupier's Law in 1988 and From Occupation to Interim Accords in 1997, he demonstrated that the Palestinian limbo is a space defined by colon continuing colonial aggression and a series of political decisions that have congealed into a legal institutional framework of apartheid that was also normalized and allowed to endure by our best humanitarian good intentions. He demonstrated that the injustice of this limbo is constructed by our actions, our decisions, and sometimes our complacency. Because of his legal work and because of his literary writing, the world can no longer deny that the Palestinian limbo is more than a humanitarian dilemma that the world can manage and contain and that the Palestinians should endure. Palestine became a question of global political justice. Raja's work as a lawyer and a legal academic models a way of doing law that is both realist about its political possibilities, but at the same time, very conscious of its power in providing an analytical framework to understand how systems of domination work. His literary works, and, and I'm going to just say the titles because they are inspiring and each one of these books is inspiring. Strangers in the House, When the Budbul Stopped Singing, Occupation Diaries, A Rift in Time, Travels with My Ottoman Uncle, Language of War, Language of Peace, Where the Line is Drawn, Crossing Boundaries in Occupied Palestine, Palestinian walks or his latest going home, a day's walk through 50 years of occupation are all beautiful and defiant. The literary and the legal in his work are mutually constitutive. The one is essential to understanding the other. Indeed, Raja's face is no aesthetic emotion, but something far higher. It is not the spontaneous inclination of the heart, but the paradox of existence. So thank you, Raja, for being with us today. It is indeed an honor. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for the uh, English and Comparative Literature Department and School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University, American University of Cairo for inviting me to give this Edward Said Memorial Lecture and thank you for Feriel, Professor Feriel Gazoul, who has been in contact with me over the past two years, for, as this event had to be rescheduled over and over again. And many thanks for you, Professor Hani Said, for this general introduction. It was May 4, 1975, when I came upon the terrifying Sunday Times report of the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh the capital of Cambodia. I was then a student in London. The report described how a once thriving city became an echo chamber of silent streets lined with empty houses and shops. Even the sick were rolled out of their hospital beds and forced to leave carrying their oxygen tanks with them. As I read this account, I couldn't stop weeping. I had no connection with that city, nor did I know anyone there. The description of the residents forced out of the city, leaving it empty, brought back what I heard from my mother about the evacuation of Jaffa 
in April 1948. It was only later that I did realize that I had never been able to imagine how it was possible to force out the Palestinian population of Jaffa, nor could I shed tears over it. The description of the tragedy that befell a faraway city brought back a belated reaction to the events of the Nakbe, which I had suppressed for all those years. For the Palestinians, memory of the Nakbe is not optional. Remembering is the duty of the oppressed, while forgetting is the luxury of the oppressor. We Palestinians carry the memory year after year like a duty and a burden, because forgetting would be tantamount to an abandonment of a right we're still struggling to realize. In contrast, most Israelis have the luxury of not only forgetting about the Nakbe, but also denying it that it ever happened at all. Palestinians have been accused by some Israelis of fabricating facts. As one Israeli journalist put it, quote, for many Palestinians, the fabrication of facts was considered normal. It's a worldview in which facts do not exist independently, but as objects one can manipulate to one's benefit, thus racking up points in a long-term struggle, unquote. According to this view, our history and our very existence as a Palestinian nation becomes a fabrication. After the Arab defeat in June 1967 war, Edward Said wrote that what he experienced was the suppression of a history as everyone around him celebrated Israel's victory at the expense of the original inhabitants of Palestine, who now found themselves forced over and over again to prove that they had once existed, unquote. Said wrote, and I quote, there are no Palestinians, said Golda Meir in 1969. And that sent me and many others the slightly preposterous challenge of disproving her, of beginning to articulate a history of loss and dispossession that had to be extricated minute by minute, word by word, inch by inch, from the very real history of Israel's establishment, existence, and achievements. I was working in an almost entirely negative element, the non-existence, the non-history, which I had somehow to make visible despite occlusions, misrepresentations, and denials." Unquote. The attempt to make visible is what I will be exploring here. I will also go further and show that beyond cultivating persistent mourning over the Nakbe, no serious attempt was made by the Palestinian leadership to understand how Israel used the law to transform its hold on the land and extend its control over the Palestinian population that remained in Palestine after Israel was established. This has meant that it was possible for Israel to use these same tactics and legal maneuverings to achieve similar results as regards the Palestinian land and people it occupied in 1967. Like all other Palestinians, I have been imprisoned by our collective past. As long as there is no recognition of the tragedy that befell us, we cannot escape that predicament. Reminders are everywhere. Throughout Ramallah, where I live, there are scores of placards with the names of the Palestinian villages destroyed in 1948. The words, Sanarja'u yawman, someday we shall return, are written underneath. The Palestinian coast with Jaffa in the horizon is visible from Ramallah. I'm often asked 
if I ever thought of leaving Palestine? My answer is that I cannot, for there can be no escape as long as there is no recognition. I will carry that burden with me wherever I go. In Reflections on Exile, Edward Said wrote, quote, exile is strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It is the unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home, its essential sadness can never be surmounted, unquote. Palestine's saga is the remarkable story of an attempt to wipe out from memory the history of a cataclysmic event, an event that did not take place during the high age of colonialism, but in the mid 20th century. Abundant documentation has always been available in the form of photographs, films, oral and written history, and memoirs chronicling every stage of that ethnic cleansing. No wonder then that writers from far and near were enthralled by the secrecy and wrote about the Nakbe, even when they had no personal connection or experience of it. Yet afterwards, they had to face a barrage of denunciation that they were fantasizing or exaggerating, as was the case when Egyptian writer Radwa Al Ashur wrote her superb novel, The Woman from Tantura, in which she described the massacre that took place in that Palestinian village by the sea. In this lecture, I will also describe how Israelis and Palestinians have engaged with the Nakbe, whether by remembering or denying it. I will end by describing two exhibits, one Palestinian and one Israeli, that both explore aspects of the Nakbe. In the introduction to his book, Reflections on Exile and Other Essays, Edward Said wrote, quote, as I've been aware for a long time, the two histories, Israeli and Palestinian, are so intricately bound together that by taking account of mine, I inevitably take account of the other and end up showing how my history has affected both the present and future of my adversary, the Israeli state and the Israeli people." Unquote. Maron Benvenesti, an Israeli historian who was deputy mayor of Jerusalem from 1971 to 1978, is one of those Israelis who remembered how the land was prior to the forced removal of the Palestinians from their country. In his book, Sacred Geography, The Buried History of the Holy Land since 1948, he writes, quote, this book is about my troubled internal landscape as much as it is about the tortured landscape of my homeland. As long as I remember myself, I have moved within two strata of consciousness, wandering in a landscape that instead of having three spatial dimensions had six, a three-dimensional Jewish space underlain by an equal three-dimensional Arab space. He then declares, I cannot envisage my homeland without Arabs. But Ben Venesti was a lone voice among Israeli political figures. Over time, the Israeli state has done all it could to eradicate the remains of Palestinian presence in the land. After 1948, Ben Gurion, the Israeli prime minister, wrote to the committee for the designation of place names in the Negev region, quote, we are obliged to remove the Arabic names for reasons of state. Just as we do not recognize the Arabs' political proprietorship of the land, so also do we not recognize their spiritual proprietorship and 
their names, unquote. Attesting to how tenaciously Israel still adheres to this policy 75 years later, when the Israeli Channel 12 News reporter Farat Nassar tweeted the innocuous news on the weather downpour of rain around the country, along with a picture of flooding, which he described as a picture from Natanya Stroke Im Khalid, a storm of comment ensued on social media against Nassar for noting the name of the Palestinian village. What then of those Palestinians who stayed in Palestine after the establishment of Israel? The actor and playwright Salim Dao is from the village of Ilbana. His family remained in Palestine after Israel was declared. In his play, Sah Salim, he describes with satire and self-deprecating humor how he could not understand why neighbors from the village who had managed to return home after their expulsion in the months of the active war were described as mutasallilin, infiltrators. As he spoke the word on stage, his face assumed an expression of perplexity, sadness, resilience, and weary endurance. He was almost in tears as he asked, these were neighbors, their homes in the village. So how did they become outlaws who could only be mentioned in whispers? In 1949, just one year after the Nakbe, the Israeli novelist S. Yizhar published the novella Khirbet Khizda. The book describes the violent expulsion of the inhabitants of Palestine, of a Palestinian village, by a detachment of Israeli soldiers. By the time the soldiers arrived, most of the young men of the village had already taken to the surrounding hills. It was mainly the elderly, the infirm, the women and children who were left behind. The Israeli soldiers blew up the houses, razed the village, and drove out its inhabitants. Khirbet Khizda remains one of the few accounts, fictional or otherwise, by Israeli writers of the Nakbe. The story is closely based on the experience of the author, who had taken part in the expulsion of the Palestinians from their land. The passage of time appears to have made no, it no easier for Israelis to write about the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in the way that Izhar did, let alone deal with its moral and legal consequences. No wonder then that the novel caused controversy and indeed a general outrage, not only at its initial publication in 1949. There was also controversy when the novella was made into a 1978 TV drama on Israeli Channel One. This sparked a public debate in Israel on whether or not it should be broadcast. Public apologists tried to interpret it as a work dealing exclusively with the pain experienced by the Jewish forces when they deprived the Palestinians of their country. For a number of years after 1948, before it was removed, the novella used to be part of the Israeli school curriculum. This has meant that generations of Israelis have been shielded from learning about the Palestinian Nakbe. This failure has meant that the Israelis can well repeat the Nakbe. The brutality that Israeli soldiers exhibit toward Palestinian civilians, stopping women in labor from crossing checkpoints to get to the hospital and forcing them to give birth on the road, for instance, reveals scant evidence of a common humanity. The majority of the Israeli public prefers to hold on to the official line that close to three quarters of a million Palestinians left their homes in Palestine on orders of the Arab leaders, which of course is a lie. More than seven decades after the cataclysmic event, the Israeli army continues to pursue policies based on the denial of Palestinians as a national group entitled to self-determination and the consequent violations 
of their civil and human rights. The latest attack on human rights was the declaration number 373 issued by the Israeli Ministry of Defense, Minister of Defense on 19 October 2021, declaring Al Haq, the human rights organization I helped establish as a terrorist organization. James Baldwin, the black American writer, tells the story of a young white boy being taken to watch a lynching. He writes, since he never faced up to the nature of the crime he witnessed as a child, Jesse is unable to understand his part in it or to forgive himself and therefore is condemned to repeat it. How many crimes must Israelis have witnessed before and after 1967 against Palestinians? their humiliation, deprivation of land and rights, and yet never having faced up to the nature of the crime their countrymen committed, young Israelis are unable to understand their part in it and therefore are condemned to repeat it. After its victory in 1967, in the 1967 war, the Israeli government was confronted by a dilemma. How to deal with the million and a half Palestinians that were living in the territories Israel occupied? They had hoped there would be a mass exodus, as happened in 1948, and were disappointed when this did not take place. Soon after their victory, the Israeli cabinet attempted to find solutions to the new situation of Israel, a country of 2.4 million taking over the West Bank, East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip populated by 1.3 million Palestinians. The prime minister, Levi Eshkol, told his ministers that he was, quote, working on the establishment of a unit or office that will engage in encouraging Arab emigration. We should deal with this issue quietly, calmly, and covertly, and we should work on finding a way for them to emigrate to other countries and not just over the Jordan River. He then added, quote, perhaps if we don't give them enough water, they won't have a choice because the orchards will yellow and wither, unquote. Even though this solution hasn't worked, the effort diligently continues. Another, this time slow, Nakbe is unfolding. But despite the attempts of Israel over the past half century to force the separation of Palestinians living in Israel and in the occupied territories, their unity was demonstrated by the common stand they, had, they took against Israeli attempts last May to evict by force 36 Palestinian families from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood who settled there after they lost their property in Western Jerusalem. Palestinians in Israel, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip presented a united front in the struggle against the Israeli policy to expel Palestinian families from their homes. The Nakbe has also continued through the enactment of new Israeli laws that serve as mechanisms for completing the task. Israeli leaders did not just carry out the crime, they went ahead and closed it with a legal garb, which they tried to justify through international law. The Israeli line was that it was all the fault of the Palestinians who rejected the partition scheme. This, by the way, is not true because there is no documentary evidence that Israel accepted the partition scheme. And in fact, they went ahead beyond the portion allocated for the Jewish state when they declared their state. They and the Arab leaders chose to go to war, so the Israeli logic goes. Following the war, new laws were needed to take care of the consequences on people and property. And here, 
Russia's war against Ukraine comes to mind. The contrast between the UK leading the call for international for the International Criminal Court at The Hague to investigate Russia's war crimes when it had vehemently opposed a similar investigation of Israel is stark and depressing. In 1950, Israel elected, enacted the absentee property law and called anyone trying to return home an infiltrator whom it was legitimate to shoot. The custodian of absentee property appointed by the law seized all the property and assets that the fleeting refugees had left behind. Every bank in the country was ordered by the government to freeze the accounts of all Arab Palestinian customers and to transfer all their balances and the contents of their safe deposit boxes to the account of the custodian. This deprived all Palestinians everywhere from having access to their money and savings. Israel had not only deprived the refugees of their properties and taken over their country, they also pursued them across the border and deprived them of the means to live in the countries where they were exiled. Israeli officials were working on the principle of no money, no country. They wanted to turn the Palestinians into beggars. And this was exactly what happened to a large number of them. Just imagine the, out, the outcry should the same happen to the Ukrainians. By the end of December 1948, every bank operating in Israel had obeyed the order. Two years later, the custodian of FCT property in Israel, who was custodian in name only, withdrew a large amount of money from the Arab bank's frozen accounts at Barclays Bank and explained to the local manager that, quote, the reasons for the substantial withdrawal of funds was to finance an irrigation scheme, unquote. The usurpation of Palestinian properties was so complete in Israel's view that it thought it right to use Palestinian funds to finance the irrigation of orchards it had stolen from the Palestinians using Palestinian funds with no intention of ever returning these orchards to the rightful owners. In 1950, the Arab Bank submitted a case in London against Barclays Bank that went all the way to the House of Lords. In 1953, this case, the court, this court issued a judgment in favor of Barclays. A year later, my father, Aziz Shahadi, took a case in the Jordanian District Court against Barclays Bank, which had also refused to pay its clients who had accounts at the bank's Israeli branches. He won the case, forcing the bank to pay up. Having won this case, he had plans to take up other cases against Israel in the courts. But this was not in line with British plans for the future and would have gone against Jordanian government's appeasement outlook supported by the British. His experience with the case revealed to him that there were possibilities for making progress towards Palestinian rights through legal challenges. One of these was to induce the government of Israel to release the income of the Arab refugees' properties now under the control of the custodian on an annual agreed basis. Clearly, this was not in line with the policies of Jordan or any other Arab country. The long-term outcome was that father was banished from Jordan before he could fulfill these plans. It is to be regretted that the blocked account case, which I've written about in more detail in my forthcoming book, We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I, due to be published next August, was neither celebrated by the authorities in Jordan, nor did it herald a new form of resistance against Israel, where the law was mobilized in the struggle. It also did not serve as an example 
after 1967 of what could be done to restrain Israeli excesses through using the law. Except for those whose money was returned, the general public, and later after 1967, the Palestinian leadership took no notice of that case as a possible way of fighting Israeli illegal actions. A similar absentee property law to the 1950 law passed by the Knesset in Israel was issued as a military order in the Palestinian territories occupied in 1967. This order was used to acquire large areas of land that belonged to Palestinians described by Israel as absentees who were not allowed to return to the occupied, uh, to occupied West Bank. Most of these lands were subsequently given to the Israeli settlers. A Palestinian legal response to this and to other similar Israeli attempts at using law to deprive Palestinians of their land was not encouraged. Our leaders had a tenacious commitment to the slogan of we shall not forget, but this was not matched by a sustained attempt at discovering how Israel was manipulating the law to acquire Palestinian properties, even when a number of Palestinian legal scholars in and outside Israel had written extensively about this. Edward Said described Zionism as a culture of detail. I would add, it's also a culture that employs the mechanism of law to carry out actions illegal under international law. The failure to consider the law as one form of struggle has contemporary significance. When negotiations took place in Oslo between Israel and the PLO during the 1991-93, the legal aspects were neglected. This was in part because the Palestinian leadership did not know enough about the Israeli legal maneuvers in the West Bank to curtail Israel from continuing to consolidate its changes in the law and entrench its control over the majority of the land in the occupied West Bank. Father would have been appalled at the complete absence of a legal grounding for the talks. So was I, and so was Edward Said. Perhaps the use of the term Nakbe to describe what happened to the Palestinians in 1948 is part of the problem. In his book, Self-Criticism After the Defeat 1967, Sadiq Jalal al-Adim pointed out that the word Nakbe is also used to describe the natural disasters and that it contains much of the logic of exoneration and the evasion of responsibility and accountability. He goes on to suggest that, quote, since whoever is struck by a disaster is not considered responsible for it or its occurrence, and even if we were to consider him so, in some sense, his responsibility remains minimal in comparison with the terror and enormity of the disaster. This is why we describe disasters to fate destiny and nature, that is to factors outside our control and for which we cannot be held accountable." Unquote. In 1963, the, the Tel Aviv municipality decided to demolish what was left of Manshiye, the Palestinian neighborhood in Northern Jaffa, which had been partially leveled in 1948 by the terrorist Ergun organization. After 1948, deprived Jewish families were moved into its ruins and inhabited those houses that were still standing. In 1964, it was decided to demolish the neighborhood. The rubble from the demolition was to be thrown in the sea. The Israeli architect Hillel Omer was tasked with designing the park, later called Charles Clore Park, that was to be built atop the debris. 
before its demolition, the architect filmed the neighborhood. In 2017, his granddaughter, the artist May Omer, found the eight millimeter film, which became the basis for her recent exhibit at Leibling House in Tel Aviv called El Ayam, to the sea in Hebrew and the days in Arabic. The exhibit from last December presents the viewer with a split screen showing Hillel's 1963 film on one side and on the other presents images of Jaffa and the park photographed by her. In an interview with the exhibit's curator, Iran Eisenhammer, the artist says her grandfather documents and destroys at one and the same time. In her investigation, she counterpoises the 1963 film with her own contemporary photos, propelled, she says, by her fascination with silenced narratives. Manshiyye is a classical example of, of hidden history. She continues, I think that the kind of story my grandfather created in his film is a very naive story. But underneath that naivete, you may sense, you can sense a repression of reality. I think my grandfather regarded Jaffa as if his generation had not been the one that fought in the war and was part of the Nakba. Unquote. Later, in response to the question, quote, what can be done with your grandfather's gaze, she offers this disappointing response, quote, what do you do with problematic history, with the weight of history? How do you deal with collective trauma and with your own personal trauma within the collective one? In the UK and in the US, for example, documents commemorating imperialist history have been removed, but Charles Glower Park has no monument to topple. The entire park is a monument. Can a park be toppled? Contemporaneous with the exhibit in Tel Aviv was another at the Palestinian Museum in, near Ramallah called A People by the Sea, curated by Ines Yassin. The exhibit features mainly the city of Jaffa and showcases many documents, photographs, and narratives that present evidence not only of Palestinian life in the city, but of the richness of the city's culture. To an extent, the exhibit is defensive, proving the Palestinian presence in the city before 1948. In the words of the curator, Quote, it's, it allows for a re-examination of the Nakbe through, present, through a presentation of 200 years of historical uh, landmarks. One of the best installations at the exhibit is by a Palestinian artist from Jaffa, Abed Abidi. On his daily walks by the sea, he collected hundreds of pieces of colored ceramic tiles and other detritus thrown back by the sea from the demolished Manshiyye, which he then grouped together to produce a map of the city. Omar's attempt at giving voice to hidden memories of the Nakbe with her exhibit in Tel Aviv, highlighting the demolition of Manshiyye and Abid's display of the remnants of the evidence of the Palestinian presence in their proud city of Jaffa are perhaps two salient ways in which the Nakbe is remembered by the descendants of its perpetrators and their victims. As I stood looking down at the floor of the Palestinian Museum with Abid's installation of the hundred fragments from the demolished homes of Jaffa's former Palestinian residents, I was acutely aware that until there is a recognition of the Nakbe, and the right of return, my own peregrinations of the memory of the Nakbe will never coalesce as these fragments have to bring relief from my shattered past.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Raja Shahadi, for this rich lecture that is both heart-wrenching and mind-wrenching. It shows the ironies of history, but also, for me anyway, it shows that the Nakba is not an event that took place in the past. It goes on. It's an act that goes on. It's difficult to say anything more because it's moving and touching and it persists. I wonder if you are willing to respond to some questions that our own students, graduate students who are writing their thesis have put together. Well, certainly. Yeah, okay. Uh, here is one question from someone who is working actually on memory. Can you elaborate on how memory informs your writing, whether fictional or non-fictional? Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of memory in my writings because many of my books are memoirs and memoirs, as the name implies, I have to do with memory. Uh, but it's, it's, I write about the way the remembered past affects the present so that, for example, when I wrote, even when I wrote, when the Bulbul stopped singing, which was a diary of the invasion of Ramallah in 2002, which was taking place as I was writing, although the time lag between the, what I was writing and the events was short, it was still about memory because I was also remembering other events that were evoked by the events that I was witnessing at the moment. And, and this is how the book uh, uh, develops. Uh, so clearly memory plays a, long, a large part in my writing. And uh, in this lecture, I concentrated on the memory of the Nakbe, which also I've returned to in many of my books. In, in one of my first major books, uh, Strangers in the House, I began the book with the, uh, uh, my, father, my grandmother looking at the uh, horizon and seeing the lights of what she thought was Jaffa which turned out to be Tel Aviv and, uh, and uh, lament, lamented what her loss. And I described how I grew up feeling that the real place was over there in the horizon and, and Jaff, uh, in Jaffa and, and Ramallah was, was a, a, a temporary place that I did not belong to, that uh, it was not a real place. The real place was over there. And, and the memories of my grandmother and father and mother and so on were, were uh, Rich the book tremendously. Uh, but other books also uh, were uh, about memory. And, uh, and you know, I've been a, a chronicler of events, and uh, I kept journals throughout the last century, half a century since the beginning of the occupation. And many of my books use those uh, diary entries uh, from, from different times. To, to, uh, to remind me of what uh, times were like then, and I use them to write uh, many of my books. So for example, in When the Line is Drawn, I was concerned with the memory of the various aspects of the relations between Palestinians and Israelis over the long years of occupation. And I uh, used a lot of the uh, 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 journals because I wanted to show that the relations and the uh, it's life then at various points was different than it is now and, and relations were different and so on. And so uh, it was over a period of about 40 years that I uh, showed the changes in the relationship to, 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 to Israel and to Israelis and to the land. But then of course, I've also written about the memory of the land. So in the Palestinian walks, for example, I described over a period of a quarter of a century, 
the changes that happened to the land. In Rift in Time, Travels with my Ottoman uncle, I went over a longer period of time of a century before the Middle East was divided by borders. And, uh, and I wrote uh, about uh, the uh, experience of my great uncle who was uh, escaping from the Ottomans and uh, over the land, uh, mainly the Galilee and, uh, and the East Bank. And I followed his, his path and wrote about the land then and now, the changes in the land as it was then and now, using his memoir of, the, uh, of that escape, uh, which he had published in, uh, in the uh, early part of the century. Uh, I've used also personal difficult memories uh, to, to, to write about with the hope of getting over the difficult memories that uh, uh, I wanted to escape. So every time I was writing about these memories, I was hoping for relief and free, more freedom and, 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 uh, and to remove that baggage, which had sometimes been uh, heavy on me. Uh, in my last published book, Going Home, A Walk Through 50 Years of Occupation, I tried to deal with memories from childhood onwards. And I thought that this would be a final attempt at clearing the slate. And in order to be able to return home and, and relax, that book was a, a day's walk in Ramallah, evoking, ev uh, in which uh, by standing at different places in Ramallah, it evoked different memories for me. And then at the end of the day, I returned home and having uh, uh, described these memories and, uh, and written about them, I expected to be, uh, 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 to be freed from, from them. And, 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 and I thought this would be the last book that I would write uh, about uh, memory. And in fact, it, it wasn't so because I then realized that there was a lot still to write about the troubled relationship with my father. And, uh, and this uh, prompted the, uh, me to write, uh, we could have been friends, my father and I, which as I said, will be published next August. Now, would this be the last book based on past memories that I will write? Only time will show. So there is the individual memory, your own memories of what happened, and you have not experienced the Nakba. First no, time. I didn't experience the Nakba. It's all in from the memories of my elders. Your family members, yeah. like your grandmother, your father. Yeah, the your interesting. Uncle. The interesting thing is that my uh, grandmother spoke a lot about uh, Jaffa and, and she almost uh, lived in Jaffa, <laughs> although she was living in Ramallah when I knew her. And, and my mother also spoke about Jaffa and, and about her experiences there. My father did not. My father was the type of person who didn't like lament and he didn't, and he found himself in, in uh, outside of Palestine and he wanted to make do with whatever possibilities there were and, and worked very hard, for example, for the return of the refugees and so on. And when that ended, he moved on to other challenges and, and didn't, didn't sit, sit and say, oh, it was this and that in Palestine, it's better and so on. He, he wasn't that kind of person. He didn't lament at all. He was a forward looking person and always wanted to uh, think of the future and, and what, what he can do and did not want the uh, despair to, over, to be overcome by despair. So, so all my memories of uh, all my knowledge about Jeff and so on does not come from him. It comes from my grandmother or my mother or other people, of course. I want to relate to ask you something effective, you know. I mean, we have all had losses and we are all in some sense Palestinians. We lost countries, we lost people in wars, we, you know, all kinds of things that have happened to us. But I found memories painful to recall things. I mean, you seem to think of it as release, right? Well, I mean, on, on the one hand, it's necessary to remember, but I also feel that some, some personal memories when I didn't act fairly or I acted cruelly and so on, uh, these uh, grate on me. 
And so my release is to write about them and, and sort of get them out of my system. And, and that's what I mean by release. Uh, and uh, other, so these are personal memories. Uh, of course, national memories, it's a different matter. And national memories, we cannot get over because un until we achieve uh, freedom and, and self-determination, we cannot uh, release these memories and we cannot forget them. So that, I think there are two different kinds of memory, personal memory and, and national memories, so to speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's another question uh, that has to do with activism and law. Does engagement in civil society require expertise in international law? Well, I think the short answer is it does not, of course, require it, because there can be many different ways of engaging in society. In my case, uh, the law was the main way of engagement, uh, engaging in, in, in society because of my background as a lawyer and worker. And I would like to say that uh, I think that uh, a writer is better off having another work other than writing uh, for many reasons. And in my case, the other work was, uh, was as a lawyer. And I think this is for many reasons because Writing itself is not lucrative, and so I would have been impoverished if I were dependent only on my writing for my livelihood. And the second thing is, uh, writing is very isolating and, and a lonely business. And so it's important to have another work that uh, means that one leaves the uh, home and the room in which he writes and uh, goes out to the world. And so it has been very important for me to have uh, my work as a lawyer, which helped me understand my society better, and, the, and also, of course, the workings of the occupation, which gave me a lot to write about. And, uh, and of course, I also was a strong and still am a strong believer in the importance of the principle of the rule of law. And, and uh, I, through Al Haq, worked on entrenching or trying to entrench the principle and, and uh, making it known and, and uh, understood because I believe that society will be better off if, if uh, living un under the principle of rule of law. And international law is an organizing uh, important principle for organizing relations between different countries. And so working on, this, on these two principles uh, gave me uh, 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 something to strive for and, uh, uh, and to uh, hope for the future. Uh, I also consider myself fortunate in my uh, engagement with Al Haq because Al Haq, uh, for a person uh, as private and uh, uh, as, as me uh, and a writer, uh, Al Haq gave me the opportunity to uh, interact with people other than the normal people, the, the ordinary people that I would interact with, and uh, and uh, uh, made me aware of. Uh, 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 many more events and things, and and uh, through field work, I needed to go to to various places which otherwise I wouldn't have gone to, and so it was an important uh, way of engagement, engaging in society and providing material for me to write about. Now, of course, Al Haq has been designated as a terrorist organization, and I would like to say here that it's our belief that this was because Al Haq was involved in collecting evidence for the case against the minister and Israeli minister and, and other officials in, in Israel for an indictment of war crimes committed during the last Gaza Strip uh, invasion. That is our belief why the organization was designated as a terrorist organization. Now, the law also is a promise and, uh, and uh, a grave disappointment. So uh, the, uh, the failure of the, of the law, both international law in the case of Palestine and, and the local law also in the case of Palestine was a, a grave disappointment. And uh, the hypocrisy that I've experienced in the world and I still experience all the time in the double standards of the application of international law uh, has been uh, very difficult to endure and has been also a subject for writing 
uh, that I've written a lot about. And, uh, and I understand, I, I, because I, I paid so much attention to the law and in understanding society, I sometimes undervalued other aspects of life, uh, so, such as the political, economic, and so on. And, and that sometimes was a failure for me, which I uh, have tried to overcome now that I'm less involved in, in, in the day-to-day uh, -day work of, as a lawyer. Uh, but uh, the uh, disappointment in the use of the law and understanding of the law and, and, and attempt at stopping Israel from pursuing its legal uh, maneuvers in the occupied territories that was evident in the Oslo negotiations was a terrible blow to me. And it is a subject that I kept continue to return to in my writing to the point that my publisher said, no more about Oslo. Please do not write about the Oslo. And I, this was always difficult because the, the disappointment was so hard to endure and to experience that I uh, wanted to write more and more and more about it. But hopefully I will stop now. OK, in relation to this, uh... I mean, people who are engaged in activism or resistance in Palestine, do you think it's helpful to know about the laws, the local laws, Israeli laws? You know, I think the people in Palestine know more about international law than more, possibly more than other places in the world. And, and yet they are disappointed, of course, with international law and its use as a vehicle for uh, achieving justice. But, but they, they do know a lot about international law and it's often spoken about, but uh, it, it depends. I mean, some activists are active in, in, in human rights and they need to know the law, but that's only one kind of activism. There are many other kinds of activism that, uh, that would uh, be helped uh, by knowing the law and how to maneuver within the law in their own sphere, whatever their activism is about and whatever their uh, attempts at achieving uh, uh, their uh, goals are, but uh, certainly uh, they don't need to be uh, 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 very uh, knowledgeable about the law because there are other kinds of activism, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, here is a more uh, literary question. Um, in your book, Occupation Diaries, the emotional intensity and rawness are reflected throughout the entire book. Do you believe that only immediacy produces a poignant account or would retrospective writing provide a subtler narrative? I don't have a, a strict opinion as to which is better. And it, I think it depends on how well the writer uh, achieve, uh, writes, uh, whether it's respect, retrospective writing or uh, immediate uh, poignant writing, such as in the diary. Uh, in occupation diaries, I chose uh, to write uh, uh, from a, a straight diary, from the journal. And uh, uh, I thought that uh, the events that I was describing were so poignant and immediate that it was best to write about them in that fashion. And then I think the way the, these events are uh, put together and, and the sequence is, is where the subtlety might come. Uh, now, I have uh, uh, two diary books, uh, more than two, but the more recent two diary books are are the occupation diaries and the when the bulbul stopped singing, and they are both about uh, severe events that uh, have uh, immediate immediacy and uh, a great uh, emotional uh, intensity, uh, and they are like an invitation into my world of daily tribulations, suffering, and joy. And uh, if I succeeded in engaging the reader, drawing the reader in then uh, then that uh, world would be described and would be experienced by the reader who otherwise uh, and 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 then the subtlety is uh, produced in in through the sequence of uh, of events that i describe if i don't succeed in engaging the reader 
uh, this, the whole thing would be jarring and artificial and even perhaps manipulative. Uh, now, it, it happens to be that, uh, well, it doesn't happen to be, but uh, it, it is the fact that uh, Occupation Diaries covers two years, 2010 and 2011, where plenty happened, plenty happened, and plenty of emotional, poignant uh, experiences. Uh, and uh, they include, for example, the uh, uh, Tahrir Square, the Arab Spring, which was something that I was so engaged in and, and wrote about with, with great intensity of emotions and so on. And, and I thought that this would be the beginning of a, a, a change in all the Arab world and, and a new life for us. And I was so excited and, and wrote about it at length in my diary and later in, uh, uh, in what I chose to publish in, in Occupation Diaries. And then there was the uh, Nakbe Day March in May 2011. It is when uh, Palestinians marched from uh, uh, Syria to the Golan Heights and they passed through an area that was supposedly mined and they were uh, being called by the uh, Golanis uh, the people in the Golan Heights, the Syrians, do not come forward because there are mines. And nevertheless, they continue to march onward and onward. And in fact, there was no, uh, they, there were no mines, and they were able to come into the Golan Heights. And in one or two cases, people uh, ended up in Jaffa. And it was a very brave and emotional time and emotional thing that I described uh, in, in in that book. And then there was the Navi Barbara the international solidarity uh, uh, ship uh, uh, to, to break the siege of Gaza. And then, of course, there was the Haredi settlement in the heart of Jaffa, which, of course, uh, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah is a repetition of that uh, experience of uh, an extremist Israeli group coming into uh, an Arab neighborhood and, and trying to create havoc and, and create uh, uh, tension. And as you all know, in last May, there was all, all these events that happened in, in solidarity with Sheikh Jarrah. And, and of course, the Sheikh Jarrah thing has not ended and it continues to arouse a lot of uh, uh, reaction and resistance by various groups. I ended that book with a condolence visit to one person whom I admired highly. And again, that was an emotional, a, a thing for me and, and a poignant uh, experience. And his name was Sabri Rayeb, who uh, was the best example of a Samid, uh, a person who was persevered, who continued to fight to keep his land. And I was involved and helped him with his fight and followed his course on and on and on for years and years and years uh, until he ended up saving a part of his land and his house, which was surrounded at the end by in three sides, on three sides, by a settlement called Givron Hadasha. And he lived in that uh, house, surrounded with, with barbed wire all around, with a small passage into his house, and with cameras, and with uh, provocations. And, and yet he persisted and insisted on staying in that house. And he died in that house. And uh, he was a, a hero, a true hero of Sumud of uh, uh, saying put and perseverance. And I had great, great respect for that man and ended the book of diaries with my visit to his house in condolence to his, for his death. And so uh, uh, the book is full of poignant episodes, hopefully put together in such a way as to create some subtle uh, narrative and, and, uh, and evoke uh, the the experiences that I wanted the reader to feel and to uh, grasp. So these diaries, you, you actually write them every day, right? You, you, you wrote them every day. Well, yes, I, I'm obsessive. Them. Sorry? I'm, obsess I'm obsessive. Yes, you're obsessive. So yeah. when you come to actually publish them, I mean, it's a, it's a private act when you write a, a diary and so on, but you, then you decided to uh, publish them. Do you uh, edit them? Do you revise anything? Do you avoid repetitions? Well, I, I don't publish them because they are massive. So they're there someday, hopefully, 
they, they might be published, but that's after my demise, I don't think in my lifetime. But uh, uh, I, uh, I go back to them. If, if I'm writing about 1982, for example, I go back to the diary of that period and read in order to, to, to realize the emotions and the feelings and the events of that time. And then I uh, select and, and write, not necessarily in the same words, different words and different things, but it, it gives me a sense of that time, which otherwise I would have forgotten, you see. And so that's how it happens. Uh, but uh, in the case of uh, uh, when the bulbul stopped singing, it was direct. Uh, I was writing daily and even hourly. And so it was a different matter, but it was a short period of intense uh, happenings, occurrences. And so I, the diary was of that short period, an actual diary of that short period. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's really relying on them to evoke the time and the emotion of the, of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just like documents, you know, like you, you use them to then write the book and so on. Well, I want to thank you very much. And I want to close by thanking all uh, of you who attended this session. Uh, and I think the talk was very informative and was very moving at the same time. Thanks, uh, my special thanks and appreciation for our department staff, Ola and Omnia, and for our graduate fellows who helped in organizing this event. And I want to end by saying, see you next year for the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Corona permitting, we will have it on November 1st and in person. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>